I'm supposed to give some welcoming remarks. I'm not quite sure what those would be. Uh, so welcome, and I appreciate all of you being here because only through statehood do the citizens of the District of Columbia have the same rights that the citizens of all the states have. It's the only way we can do it. Now, there are many uh, other uh, uh, initiatives that have been tried, and I don't want to criticize those. And in fact, I am somebody who has supported incremental steps in the past and will continue to do so. But the ultimate, which is that we want all of the rights that citizens have, we can only achieve if we receive. Statehood. And so we see with some of our most recent initiatives, such as pursuing budget autonomy, and I want to thank Congressman Tom Davis for his support for that over the years. Um, and we've gotten support on both sides of the aisle in Congress for budget autonomy over the years. And yet, somehow, Congress continues to be resistant. And in fact, I would say that what's been happening recently with their efforts to disapprove budget autonomy, that was approved through a legitimate process of help by the courts. Um, the, the, what's going on in Congress is just mean-spirited, and it, it speaks to why the pursuit of statehood is is uh, really ultimately the only the only approach. Uh, you know, what difference does it make to Congress at this point whether or not we have budget autonomy? Uh, we have made that the law through a legitimate process. Congress has not approved our budget on time. Yeah, since the 1990s. Congress has not made a substantive change to our budget since the control board. Uh, Congress really is not interested when we go there and we say, hey, we got a problem like the salary for the chief financial officer, which we can't control because Congress left that to themselves. They're really not interested. We knock on the door and there's nobody there to answer. And if there is somebody, they've actually got other things that they, they consider more important. Um, then the only way we can get around this relationship is through statehood. I didn't mean to speak so long on that point, and I think you all uh, understand it and other arguments for it. Let me say something about the process. So over the years, we've tried many different processes from a constitutional amendment in the 1970s. We had a lawsuit that I thought had some very good arguments a decade ago. Uh, what the court said is really, this is a political solution. A political solution means Congress, and it means statehood. Um, what we did, the council did a couple of years ago, a bill that Mayor Gray sent to the council to uh, reorganize and eliminate some of the commissions, the boards and commissions. Uh, the council added to that legislation uh, a substantial reorganization of the statehood effort in the district government. We've had three uh, what we call shadow representatives since the late 1980s, uh, maybe 1990, and uh, we did nothing more than they just existed. And they got some money, uh, maybe if we gave them some money or through the tax checkoff that we had adopted uh, roughly 15 years ago. But through the Boards and Commissions Bill a couple of years ago, we formalized the shadow representatives as part of a five-member statehood commission, the other two being the mayor, other two members being the mayor and the chairman of the council. And in this way, I think, actually elevated the shadows so that the mayor has to work with them, the chairman of the council on behalf of the council has to work with them. And in fact, that's the process that the mayors used with the Constitution to turn to the commission and use the commission as a process. And as was noted by John, the commission earlier this week approved a draft constitution. Um, the other point I would make is that we need a plan, in my view. What I've seen over the years is that the discussion about statehood is always a discussion amongst ourselves within the borders of the District of Columbia. In fact, to succeed, we have to take that conversation outside of the district. And to do so, I think we have to have a plan. What I've seen over the years is what I consider a series of one-offs. So we, for example, with the convention in 2012, we uh, had uh, billboards in Charlotte. Uh, Senator Brown heard me talk about this the other day. Um, it was gr a great strategy, but it was like a one-off. At the end of the convention, that's kind of the end of it. Or a few years ago, members of the council went up to uh, Ver Ver uh, New Hampshire uh, to get support from the uh, from the uh, legislature, which we got, which was great. It was, you know, it's now a distant memory. We need a plan, a coordinated plan, and I'm hopeful that the commission 
uh, is the place to develop that plan. Now, specifically the process that we have today, and I want to acknowledge and thank the mayor for coming up with this strategy, and it's a plan that with the new Congress and new president, because we know we'll have both in January, that we will be prepared to present a petition for statehood. And so we're following roughly the ten so-called Tennessee plan. And uh, the uh, commission adopted the constitution earlier this week. It will be introduced in the council as a bill before the council goes on recess. Uh, we will have uh, hearings on that, so they'll continue to be a public process and adopt that as quickly as we can. Meanwhile, a resolution has already been introduced by all 13 members of the council that will be voted on on July 12th, and that is to put on the ballot the advisory referendum for November 8th. It will answer four questions, and the four questions are uh, that the voters agree that the district should be admitted to the union as a state, approve a, uh, a constitution of the state of New Columbia to be adopted by the council, approve the state of New Columbia's boundaries, and agree to the agree that the state of New Columbia shall guarantee an elected representative form of government. So that resolution will be adopted uh, by the council, and then it will be on the ballot uh, as an advisory referendum on November 8th. Uh, but I think that we need to continue to look and challenge ourselves for a plan, a plan that goes beyond this, that's broader than this initiative, that looks at how we are going to get support in a coordinated fashion, not a series of one-off steps, uh, so that we get a majority of the states pressuring Congress uh, to uh, grant us statehood. So again, I want to thank you all for being here uh, and your interest in, uh, in statehood. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Your remarks uh, were, were fed, fed, feed right into the question I was asking. All right, so we've got all the enthusiasm now and an outline of a plan to get to Congress, but how do you do, what do you do after that? Where's the money, where's the effort to build support outside of the district rather than just to hope to expect it and to get some attention from the White House, uh, which we haven't gotten much of the last few years? And I ask you, Mr. Cook, to start. What next? Well, I think that um, the, the, the mayor has certainly acknowledged in my conversations with her as a member of this the legal team with, with John and others, uh, that what we've got to do next after we uh, continue to build enthusiasm and momentum here locally, we've got to embark on a, a much larger national strategy uh, that brings this issue to the attention of the American public, uh, develops momentum um, out in the 50 states so those persons can motivate their elected officials because the ultimate decision uh, is that of the Congress. Uh, in 1990, when the Reverend Jesse Jackson was elected to, to, one, to be one of our first uh, uh, so-called shadow senators, uh, I had the good fortune to work as uh, his counsel. And one of the things that the Reverend and I did was uh, to travel around the country and talk to people in states uh, state legislators, state democratic parties, state uh, groups of various groups to talk about statehood for the district and to talk about why it was important. And one of the things that was really uh, heartening to me was that it only takes a few minutes of explaining this to people outside the District of Columbia for them to get it. And there is uh, almost a unanimous and sort of organic realization that we're being treated differently and inappropriately in terms of American uh, democratic ideals. We have to do more of that, and we have to get people out there in the states, uh, Iowa, Kansas, it, it doesn't matter where you are, and it's not even a partisan thing. I mean, people get it. We've got to then translate that, poli that into politics, into political action, and, and where then the politics are important, because when you talk to the elected officials in the Congress, it is important uh, from a left-right, Democrat, Republican sort of uh, perspective, uh, even an urban-rural perspective. And we've got to overcome that. So there needs to be a commitment on the part of the district government and its citizens to this. Uh, we need to be insulted. We need to be indignant. We need to be offended enough to consistently apply pressure and to raise this issue among our fellow citizens. And then we also need to take that energy outside the district and to uh, generate the support. And that means it's gonna cost us money. And we've gotta be willing to write a check. We've gotta be willing to tell chairman, the mayor, we've gotta decide that we wanna spend several tens of millions of dollars for our statehood. 
Mm -hmm. and, and John, follow up on that. Where's the political action committee? Not that you know anything about campaign finance. <laughs> but where's the political action committee? Where's uh, someone asking Eric Holder to lead a political action committee, even if as the honorary chairman or someone of that stature, to start that march outside of the city? Right. The, so the answer is it hasn't happened yet, and it needs to happen. I agree with what the chairman has said. I agree with what, what, uh, what Fred has said. You know, I've been working on this for, you know, 20 years now, and frankly, we have never had a serious strategy. You know, we've had a lot of tactics, okay, and people always mistake tactics for strategy. The license plates were great. They got a lot of attention. That's a tactic. Going down to the Potomac River and throwing tea into the river gets attention, but that's a tactic. It's not a strategy. A strategy is the intellectual underpinning of your enterprise, right? And so the NRA, they have a great strategy, okay? They use people's passion for the Second Amendment to drive action, okay? The ARP. They have a great strategy. Everybody turns 50 years old, they get a letter in the mail saying you are now part of this organization and, and we are going to advocate you know, on, on your behalf. LGBT rights, okay? The LGBT community realized they had economic power and they could stand up to big corporations and say, hey, we're gonna boycott you, you know, if you don't um, act in, in, the right, in the right way. So, so we need that kind of a strategy. I don't know off the top of my head right now what it is, but I think we need to engage you know, the best minds to come up with it. And here we sit in the middle of the District of Columbia where we have the most concentration of political power, we have a concentration of economic power, we have opinion makers. This is the exact place where we can draw on that expertise to be able to do it, and it's gonna take, I think, tens of millions of dollars to do it. And if people are uncomfortable with city money, then let's raise some private money because if Coca-Cola had a bet the company proposition Okay, they would spend tens of millions of dollars on it. And frankly, I think this is a bet the company proposition for the District of Columbia. Beverly Perry is the special senior special assistant to the mayor. She has raised a lot of expectations with all the things that she has to do as mayor, including preparing to run for reelection. She's raised the expectations. What do you see the mayor doing in terms of building the financial support outside the city. I know she's gone to the Democratic National Committee, she's done all these things, but it seems like she's gonna to have to do more. What would that be? And well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me just tell you, Tom, this mayor is so excited about, she challenged our team to come up with a plan, and I think you heard the chairman say that uh, we did that. We came up with this Tennessee plan, and we're doing that. Um, the mayor, we were just out at the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Indianapolis. Uh, she put forth a resolution, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, unanimously passed a resolution to support us. So she's not going to just do that at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Every conference that comes to the convention center, when she brings welcoming remarks, she will put this issue on the table. Is, um, is she willing to spend city taxpayer money for a political action committee, whatever the legalities of that are, well, to help fund it, to kickstart it? She is willing to spend city money, as we have. I mean, we have, we have done a lot of um, planning, and we have convened, we have held our convention, we have developed our constitutions, and if you didn't get a draft of this, we still have some of those around, even though we have our second draft in the as the chairman just said. Um, yes, yeah, she's willing to spend appropriated money to the extent that it's legal. Uh, we recognize that there will have to be um, some other efforts outside of the government because the government has some restrictions. Um, in addition to what the chairman said about the plan that we have, we have five committees. Um, and in the statehood effort, we have an advocacy committee that's led by former Mayor Tony Williams. We have not created the instrument yet that by which we can receive money, but we have to do that. But our first efforts were to, um, and our, all of our energy has been centered around getting a document that all the residents could rally around and get it to the council, which you heard the chairman say on the 12th, they will uh, vote on that document. So after that vote, 
uh, we will have our energy all around developing all the grassroots efforts, all of the uh, 50 states efforts. Um, so we plan to do that. And, it, and as Fred said, it's the bipartisan efforts. I'm calling all my friends, both Democrats and Republicans in other states. Good. Uh, so we're moving forward. Let's hear now from um, Mike DeBonis. I think, Mike, you still live in the city, don't you? Yes, Tom, I still live in the city. Just trying to check, <laughs> check your bona fides. Um, uh, but you're on Capitol I pay, Hill. I pay property taxes now. I'm actually a real DC resident. we can check resident. online. Um, <laughs> Why uh, you? Where did the hate come from? <laughs> or it sounded like a defensive remark, and maybe we should check. In uh, any event, uh, Mike is on Capitol Hill. Uh, he, uh, let's hear from Mike about what is the hurdle up there on Capitol Hill? You see it from both being a local resident and a person who's intimately familiar with the way Congress is running or not running these days. Whatever you want to say. Sure. Well, I mean, thanks, Tom. And yes, the, the, where the rubber meets the road here is in Congress, in the 535 members of Congress. And the, the, the hurdles are a matter of basic civics class. Uh, you need a, in the Senate, you need uh, 60 senators who, uh, who sympathize with you and, and want to advance your, your cause. In the House, you need a, a leadership and a majority party who are uh, feel similarly. Um, Right now, you have neither, and um, on, on the Hill right now, my sense is that there is a, a widespread awareness that this that this uh, movement, um, as it is, exists, uh, thanks to the efforts of the elected officials, starting with Delegate Norton, Mayor Bowser, Chairman Mendelssohn, on down the the, the shadow delegation, of course. Um, you know, DC vote and all the work they've done over the years, and the grassroots work that's really popped up you know recently uh, has been tremendous because they're in in actual uh, uh, members offices on a regular basis telling them we want action on this now there is an awareness that doesn't necessarily mean uh, there is sympathy uh, there there is sympathy certainly among many Democratic members uh, to varying degrees I think uh, Republicans by and large aren't um, uh, I think they're willing to listen. I don't I haven't seen any uh, evidence that they're willing to take action with the the, the, the there have not been any Republican co-sponsors on the statehood bills. And why should they repo any Republican support two states, two senators right. from the District of Columbia with the most likely to be Democratic? I would be suicide. The, you know, the the problem that was as expressed, I believe, by Mark Plotkin of the you know DC being too liberal, too black, too Democratic still exists with. The biggest problem being that it's too dem democratic, um, and uh, you know th that remains a, a huge uh, obstacle. Um, you know, there are, and, and so there are reasons to be pessimistic right now. If you look at the 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 Congress's relationship with the district, we had a period after the control board. There was a period of what could be called you know salutary neglect that you know extended from you know. Uh, you know, certainly when the, the, the period where the, the Democrats took the House majority in 2006, up into about two, three years ago, where the Republican members started, you know, meddling in a serious way again, whether it was the marijuana issues last year, the, the, rep the reproductive rights bill, and now budget autonomy, where you have, uh, you know, House members who are certainly determined to uh, reassert their uh, authority over the district. Um, What's going to change that? Um, there's a lot of reasons in the medium to long term to be hopeful, and we can talk about that a little later. Okay. So yeah. may I just add something to that? Uh, this whole strategy is um, based on timing. Um, 2017, we will have a new president, and we will have... President Trump. President Trump, President Trump it might be, it doesn't matter. We will have a new president and we will have a new Congress. There will be many new members. The one thing that we know, that when people get elected to Congress, you can go into any platform around the country and everybody say, says that Washington is not doing anything. I want to go to Washington to do something. So we want to capture that energy of a new Congress coming, wanting to do something. 
And we believe that when we educate people and when we talk to people about the civil rights violation that we had that occurs because 700,000 people in the District of Columbia do not have a voting Congress. We believe that we are going to change attitudes. We have to believe that we can change attitudes. We are energized behind that. And Good. Mike, I beg to differ. Oh, well, I would. <laughs> my um, my sense is that there is a great deal of sympathy am among the members who are would be naturally sympathetic to the district and its lack of civil rights. Um, that sense of sympathy exists. Um, and the desire to take action. What is lacking is a sense of urgency. Um, I don't. Th I think Fred was right, and Beverly, you're right too. I think what they don't see is the um, grassroots groundswell for action. We are going to create it in the district, starting, and it starts with the starting district. with the DC bar. <laughs> okay, uh, so, I'm, I'm going to uh, just also say. I think the fact of the matter is that we do need to we do need to cultivate more Republican champions. I mean, no matter. You know who wins the White House, no matter what happens uh, in the Congress uh, in the election. You know the high water mark for Republican support for DC rights was 1978. <laughs> you know when bipartisan uh, majorities passed the the Voting Rights Amendment for DC, and you know we've had you know glimmers of light, including Tom Davis, who is here, no greater Republican friend of the District of Columbia than Tom Davis, with the possible exception of Jack Kemp who was very strongly in favor of DC rights. Of course, he is the mentor, the intellectual mentor of the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. Um, so I'm not willing to give up on my Republican friends, but I think that you know every, every strategy that we come up with has to bear in mind that we need to cultivate those new champions. Tom is no longer in the Congress. Jack Kemp is no longer with us. 1978 was a long time ago. We need to do a better job of cultivating uh, those champions. No, no. Okay, good. Uh, it's, I'm going to invite Congressman Tom Davis to come down. If you have any more, if you have too much air in your balloon over this, he may take some of it out with his remarks. But I also want to point while he's coming down to the microphone here that that comment about the four twos, I think it's too urban, too liberal, too democratic, and too black, but did not come from Mark Plotkin. and he was quoting Walter Fontroy. There's who, and I want to note, I was I out at the Ted airport Kennedy. this week he, he, when... He was actually I think it was actually Ted Kennedy. <laughs> well, he, he said that, oh, yeah. well, then the, I knew it wasn't Potkin. But anyway... <laughs> well, the only one... The, only one that, just the, record, the record has I just been want to corrected. Say, I was at the airport when Walter Fontour came back. It's quite frail. We're hoping that he's going to be all right. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the only one of the twos that matters is too democratic. I think the others are irrelevant and just kind of throw gasoline on the fire. I mean, it's just my uh, judgment. So, as you know, we got 23 uh, Republican members to vote for voter rights for the House of Representatives, which is a completely different issue. Uh, Congress, uh, we were able to get uh, some strong legal authority from Viet Dinh and Ken Starr saying under the district clause, uh, the city has the, uh, the Congress had the right to do that through majority. I think it's fine. It's too short. Yeah, it's okay. Um, and we made, we've made a, so we got it through the House. It was killed on the filibuster in the Senate. Had we uh, had a leadership in the Senate that was willing to to uh, uh, to really tackle this thing, I think we might have been able to turn that around. Then when I left the House, uh, they got it through the Senate, uh, but they couldn't get it through the House because of the gun amendments and nobody wanted, they wanted the perfect bill. They didn't want to take it. And, and that was kind of the stars were aligned. I mean, one of the problems you have, you had a Democratic president, you had 60 votes in the Senate, you had overwhelming majority in the House and nothing happened. Uh, it's just not a priority uh, at this point. It's about kind of better as an issue, and maybe maybe you can stoke that fire and, and, and turn that around. Uh, but it's going to take some time, and I think a Republican strategy is a is a real a very real problem. I just I talked to a lot of members, and I mean one of the issues is the city, as you know, has to have two city council members that are of, of not of the majority party. And I was looking at Michael, uh, other Michael Brown, Michael Brown up there uh, as an independent member of the city council. And CNN, his tagline is Democratic Political Consultant. I mean, it just for for guys on my team up there, it, they just look at this thing and why are we going to hand over two Democratic uh, votes in the Senate um, in a very, very partisan city? The, the best Republican performance ever in the city was 18% of the vote in the presidential election, the year when nationally they were getting 60%. 
Um, so I don't know how you tackle that over time, except for a lot of conversations. I mean, I, I've got some suggestions I don't need to give here, but but I think that is a, a huge problem. And, the, and when you go to the back rooms, you can talk about rights all you want, but for the average member, it's like they spend $15, $20 million on a Senate seat, and they're going to just hand over uh, two seats. It just really doesn't work. Now, that's not the spoken rationale. I can go back to the Constitution. I can go back to 1783 uh, when the... Uh, uh, pensioners marched on the uh, Continental Congress and drove them up the river. And Madison wrote in, in Federalist 46, uh, you know, we need our own enclave. We can go on the history where they almost moved the capital to Philadelphia. In fact, the House at one point voted to move the capital from New York to Philadelphia. Uh, the Southerners held it up. And you got to ask, if it had gone to Philadelphia, you think Philadelphia wouldn't have had a vote in the House? I mean, uh, and talk, it, I, I know the history very well, but it's a huge problem. And you can get as much grassroots in the city as you want, but cities react differently uh, than the, uh, rural areas. And the Republicans right now are a pretty rural-dominated uh, uh, a party. Uh, you don't find many Republican cities in America today. So nothing to do with anti-black. It's not to do with any lip but it is a very Democratic city at a time when the balance of power in the Senate goes back and forth every two years. House is a gerrymandered house and it's likely to stay Republican even in a bad year. So you've got to you've got to deal with those things, and right now I think relations between the city and Congress are as bad as I've seen it uh, since I got there in uh, in '95, and uh, we wrote, did the control board to in, to include the control board. You mean they're, well, they're see, worse actually, than that? Well, let, let me just say, it remind you, the control board vote uh, was a unanimous vote in the House. Eleanor Holmes Norton supported the control board bill. Uh, Alice Rivlin wrote it with me. Right. If you think that was bad, I think the control board actually did a lot of good for the city at a time. No, 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 no. I'm just talking about. Do you think the you said that the relationship dynamic was worse now than it's ever been before? And I think the yeah. relationship dynamic was worse then. Now, that's not to say the control board didn't do a, a constructive job. It's just that I think the the the, the dynamic between the district uh, elected officials and the Congress was horrible during that time. But, but well, yeah, I we. We've got our perspectives, but I, I say that was the same Congresses, uh, the same group of people that ended up getting the city out from under its five billion dollar pension liability, the same one that gave the College Access Act. I thought that was a pretty good relationship. You may have a different view. No, on no, those are good results, but those are that that has nothing to do with the relationship because the relationship well, was absolutely we're paternalistic. We're interested, we're Congress in had ignored the district for years and years and years, had screwed us out of so much money, and then came in and fixed it, and that was a good thing. And it was a but that wasn't because and it, it was, was a, a Republican Congress that fixed it, just so we get it. Straight. Absolutely, and a Democratic Congress absolutely. that ignored it. Abs well, Democrats and Republicans had, had ignored it since 1801, so it's not just the Republicans or just the Democrats. Right, we don't exist. Uh, let me ask you. You said you have some suggestions. Well, I'm not. I, I mean, I'm happy to, to uh, in a public forum. To, you agree to that the all. pack is needed? Is something to do with some well, a political I, I movement? Look, That's what we all I, talked about. That. You know, look, I, you, you just you have a huge cultural divide in this country right now in terms of the way people yeah. view things, and we're just going to view things uh, differently. You know, I grew up in the suburbs and. And uh, I, I view the life through different lenses, but I respect your perspective. I think it's an important perspective. It needs to be molded into policy. I think you need to take a look at what are everybody else's perspectives on this and sit down and figure out a way to work through it. And that means compromise. And that's something the city has been very reluctant to embrace when it comes to these. It's oftentimes all or nothing. No, and that's and, not and, the way the legislative process right. works. And I agree with you. I mean, look, Mr. Davis, I think, is very uh, legitimately titled a friend of the district. He has been there for us. And he is the kind of Republican that you can sit down and have a conversation with and exchange the ideas. You may not agree, but you believe, I think at the end of the conversation, you've had a thoughtful discussion. So, so I, I think that for both sides, Republicans and Democrats, people who care about this and people who don't care so much about it, the, the important piece of this is we've got to have some discussions and there have got to be some compromises made. So, yeah, I disagree with some of the philosophic positions that, that Tom Davis shares, but I don't think he is insincere. I don't think he is malicious. I don't think he is unmindful of the situation that exists. So I think that if there were more people on his side of the aisle or on his team, as you referred to it, who were willing to have the, the kind of discussions that we're talking about and around to some degree here, uh, I think we could make some progress. Um, 
the uh, well, let me just stop. I mean, even without me, you, you had an opportunity when President Obama came in, where you had 60, 60 Democratic sure. senators. You didn't need any Republicans. Right. You had an overwhelming majority of the House, and, and like nothing happened. I think it took him two years to put the license plates on. Oh, yeah. Um, so the, the, al the, the one alternative is you can always go for the stuff shot because the parties are moving. There's very little middle in American politics today. So you can always wait. The problem is, it looks like the way the Senate line, if you look next two, three, four times, it's gonna, it's, nobody's going to get 60 votes anytime soon. Right. Uh, and that, that's kind of the magic number for the, for the stuff shot. Uh, you can right. have the House. So the alternative is we've got to find some Republicans over there on the other side. And I think that's my point is I think that's gone backwards. Uh, right. I think it has. And, and, and I think we need to find some. I mean, and, and as you point out, the Democrats are not um, sort of inherently uh, inclined to do this. Part of the, 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 the two fours, the, the four twos that Senator Kennedy talked about is that we're too urban. And Democratic senators who are from non-urban areas don't support statehood as a general proposition because the agenda of urban America is not the same agenda as non-urban America. So even among Democrats who don't necessarily come from urbanized areas, they don't feel sort of a natural inclination to support this. So I think that we've got to sort of talk a lot of people through this uh, on both sides of that. Well, but the, the question with respect to Republicans for me is, who's the next Tom Davis? <laughs> you know, I mean, who's, who's the next guy who's willing to go into the Republican conference as Tom Davis did at a time when it was very difficult to talk to Republicans about the District of Columbia and to go member by member and say, this is something we should care about. This is something that's, that's, that's worth doing. Frankly, I thought it would have been Paul Ryan. I thought Paul was perfect for it. You know, Paul Ryan cares about poverty, you know, deeply. Paul Ryan, not many people know this. When I was Eleanor Holmes Norton's legislative director, he was legislative director to Sam Brownback, who was then the chair of the, of the D.C. Uh, committee in the Senate. And, you know, Paul understands, understands the district. Jack Kemp was his mentor. You know, Kemp obviously was a strong supporter and, of D.C. And so Paul voted for D.C. voter rights. He did. He did, because you asked him to. And so, you know, where is the next Tom Davis? Where is the next Republican who's willing to stand with us and to advocate for these issues? How do you lobby this, uh, the House Speaker? How do you lobby him? I think Paul's one of the most, uh, the least political, and you have to be somewhat political to, you know, where he is. I mean, he's got certain party obligations and so on. You see in the presidential race where he's uncomfortable be doing institutionally what he has to do. But I think you just open up a long dialogue with him. I think the city's done a very, uh, it has not done a good job through the years of opening up those dialogues in an appropriate fashion and just letting people understand where you are and why you're where you are. It's just like it, they, they, don't, they think you're from another planet sometimes when you come in. It's not the Republicans don't have an urban agenda. They have a different agenda because they have different constituency groups. They're not beholden to unions and all that, that kind of thing. And, and, and I think in some ways that would actually be healthy for the city. But that's, that's my own opinion. But I think that understanding that perspective and having those discussions, it takes a while and you figure out who these people are. I was lucky because I happened to be chairman of the subcommittee and the full committee that had jurisdiction on the city. And I've been chairman of the campaign committee, so I have a little juice. And I saw a, a, some wrongs and wanted to right it. I, I think of all the accomplishments, and I'm proud of the college access bill I sponsored, and I think the control board really worked for the city. But the one I'm, and the voucher bill, we get people who get in this room probably going to disagree, but uh, is the DC uh, and DC college access. But getting the city out from under that $5 billion pension liability made all the difference in the world. Do you, do you think that was not an easy lift? No. Uh, no, not an easily, but it you was think it's it's absolutely, absolutely necessary that the re this Democrats have to take back the Senate for this statehood effort to go forward. Well, you need sixty, you votes. Have 60 you're, votes. You're not going to get you're not going to get a fifty-two forty-eight uh, statehood uh, vote. You're going to need sixty votes to bring in a new, a new state. I don't see any that's going to change in any way uh, at this point, and uh, so you're going to need some Republicans to do that. And I think that's going to require more than 60 Democrats, frankly, because I think that there will be some Democrats who won't be. Able, well, let me make one point. Institutionally, Virginia and Maryland have always been a little hesitant to support statehood because of the commuter tax issue that comes. Right. Up. Tim Kaine has said he supports statehood for the district, but I think he, frankly, if I can just editorialize, I think he supports it. Maybe he agrees with it, but he thinks it will never come back. He won't have to really deal with it. Like some of the people who voted in Britain, they thought it would never pass. Right. Now, look, this is a long dialogue, and I think it, the, the residents of this city, the capital of the free world, uh, you have some, some basically unique arguments to make. But I see, I see we're in an echo chamber in this room, and I may be the only guy not echoing, but I just want to put a douse of reality of somebody who's been through these battles and has produced results, not just a lot of talk. 
that this is a this is a longer term process, and the more you hoop it up in the city, sometimes you get the backlash on the hill, because they're such different cultures. And so you, you need to do both. You need to build it in the city. You want to have a united city uh, behind it. Um, I mean, I, I mean, go ahead. I just wanted to point out that another thing regarding the dynamics in the House, the parties have changed in the six years since House Voting Rights Act came up. The Republican Party is now more rural. It's uh, more conservative. The Democratic Party is basically given up on uh, trying to win, you know, moderate to conservative districts. Um, they're trying right now. The 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 DCCC is trying to rebuild their majority, trying to win suburban seats uh, that Republicans have held for a long time. Not trying to get back rural seats or uh, uh, moderate seats. I, I think that you know the, the parties in terms of their orientation are getting farther apart. They're not. There's no middle. There's, there's no middle left, and there's yeah. very, no rural Democrats. In terms of we're, to, we're we're looking for the next uh, Tom Davis, and you know it's it's hard to find. And you know all the points about Paul Ryan are, are very well put. I was there uh, what uh, three weeks ago when he was in Anacostia to roll out his big anti-poverty plan. And it was Paul Ryan, who, who obviously was a Jack Kemp Republican, cares deeply about these issues. He was there with, by and large, uh, Southern conservative chairman of, of standing committees who have not spoken word one about the District of Columbia or really even you know urban I issues in a direct way uh, for their entire political careers. You know, it's not to say somebody, you know, if, if there's a smart effort to find find the right member and, and you know, uh, advocate for that, uh, it couldn't happen, but it, it's hard to look around. You know, Maryland, you know, Connie Morell is gone. Maryland is going to be, a, a, the Maryland suburbs are going to be represented by Democrats for the near future. And, in, in the, you know, Mr. Davis's seat is now held by a Democrat, Barbara Comstock, who has Tom Wolf's seat. I don't know that there's been any effort to to recruit her, but I don't think that she's someone who's naturally sympathetic to this cause. Um, and you, or in a position look to be, do it. I mean, it goes, you know, the committee structure uh, matters on this. But look, I, again, there is, there is no middle in American politics. Democrats are becoming more urban, Republicans more, uh, more rural. And, you know, we are stuck institutionally. It's very difficult for the Democrats to take back the House, given the alignments. We used to say the legislatures in the old days, the legislatures elected the senators, the people elected the House members. Now the legislatures elect the House members. By the way, they draw the line. The people yeah. elect the senators. When you think about it, it, it it's backward. But this is a long conversation. So you start with, you, I think you continue with Paul Ryan. You make, you make those discussions. You at least make him aware of the situation. There may be grounds for a deal down the road. Uh, it's always a deal. Alaska and Hawaii came in was right. a deal. You had a Democratic state at that point, uh, uh, which was Hawaii, uh, Dem uh, Alaska and a Republican state, Hawaii. Now they reverse themselves over. There's been some if suggestion could, that Puerto Rico could do that. We, of course, it has Puerto Rico, $70 billion in debt. But the House has, uh, is, is at one point, we passed a bill allowing Puerto Rico to hold a referendum and then probably honor the referendum, and it didn't pass because it's so divided in, in Puerto Rico. But Puerto Rico's had a series of Republican governors, uh, Republican mayors of San Juan. Their legislature's gone back and forth, and it has not shown the same proclivity of one party uh, that, that the D.C. has. I mean, I, I think one way you start is you start electing people's independence and taking that off. Uh, I think that takes a lot of the stigma off. Now, the Democratic Party in the city won't like it, but it opens it up to particularly a lot of new voters coming in at a time when, frankly, most people don't like either party. So it's, uh, but that's that's a decision. The city a nonpartisan legislature, city, a nonpartisan. Yeah, city I mean, Nebraska has a nonpartisan legislature. Minnesota did before a few years ago. But I, I think it takes a little bit of the stigma off at this point. It doesn't mean you're uh, in uh, in Puerto Rico. You caucus with one party or another, but you have a statehood party and a popular Democratic party. But uh, but then, and they've caucused with both parties as it's gone on. So I think there's some ways over time, but that discussion needs to begin. But look, we had, I, as you know, I was on the amicus brief for, for budget autonomy. I think you ought to have that. That's a basic right. Um, but now you've got Republicans in the House going after it. We had it calmed down for a while, but I think the referendums and the other thing, they just pushed them and they wanted to just show who's boss under the district clause. I don't know if anything comes of it or, or right, not. But, but that's, that's what's um, so offensive to me, because it turns, it turns me into a political pawn for a Republican political agenda or a conservative political agenda. And that just, that just annoys the hell out of me. When I was in the United States Air Force, I volunteered. Nobody asked me if I was from the District of Columbia and if I had the right to vote. 
they put me in a position to risk my life for the principles that the Constitution I got enunciates. It. So when you tell me and somebody like me that, well, you know, you need to wait, uh, because unlike you, Tom Davis, most of the members of Congress don't know anything about this city, don't care to know, don't inform themselves, but they want to say at the same time, well, the Constitution makes me responsible for your welfare, but then they don't give a damn. So, so I have a real difficult time listening to someone like that say to me, we're going to act in your best behalf. We don't think that you know you guys are it. ready. Uh, we don't think uh, that uh, two more Democrats is in my political interest. Well, what about my political interest? What about my rights? And so it's a real hard sell. And until we sit down and talk, like you're talking about, until members of the Congress on either side of the aisle can sit across eyeball to eyeball with people and understand their concerns, understand why they're concerned, and hear back the other way, maybe we can figure out a way to get to some common ground. But too often in my experience, and I've been doing this since 1972 when I was in law school, the people on the so-called Republican or conservative side don't want to really engage in dialogue. At least not. Very few of them want to engage in dialogue. And so it makes it real hard to get there. Isn't, isn't that the core issue is how do you move an act? That's why I keep bringing up a political action committee, real money spent to do research on the members of Congress and where they're from and wh who they know in the Washington. I mean, do a real hardcore ground up oh, work. I, I mean, I understand your anger. And every time you say Republicans and conservatives, it's just, you know, you, 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 I understand how you feel about us, but I just think at the other hand it's not helpful when you go up and talk to people. You don't like to demonize them. There are a lot of avenues the city has to, to bring in uh, people and have this conversation. It's and not I about demonizing them, Tom. I, I don't want to demonize them. I, 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 don't, I don't approach them when I was doing this. You know, I don't bust into their office and, 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 and break bad. My problem is that they don't want to talk. You can't get them to engage. Sure you can. And, and that's the issue for me. I'm, I'm, I'm a peace-loving guy. You know, I think what, I think what <laughs> I think what Tom Sherwood is talking about is important, which is, you know, we have to reward our friends and punish our enemies. I mean, that's part, that's part of politics, right? That's part of That's, that's part how of we game. lost Max Baucus. Yeah. yeah. And, right. Well, ask, ask Locke Faircloth, okay, who, you know, who kind of came after the city, and we sent folks down there, you know, to, to, to protest him. Now, did Locke Faircloth lose because of us? Maybe not, but did it help him? No, it didn't help him at all. So Jimmy McMillan lost his seat because of well, that. So, Johnny so, McMillan. That was John McMillan. McMillan. Right. McMillan so, was so the having one the kind of political action committee that Tom's talking about, where you can, you know, inject some money, you know, into these races, and and you know, and I'm talking about, you know, if, if our friends turn on us too, I'm not just talking about Republicans. I mean, let's remember that. I mean, I love I love my president. I love Barack Obama, but remember, he is the guy who said, you know, John, I'll give you DC abortion. You know, talking to John Boehner and threw us under the bus. So he needs to face consequences. For that. Yes. So and if I could hold our friends accountable too. And uh, to jump on that point, we're talking about who's the next Tom Davis in the Republican Party. Who is the who is our champion besides Eleanor Holmes Norman in the Democratic Party? Which congressman do you go to 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 stand up for the district? If she were not there at this moment, who would that be? Well, well, and in the it's Senate, Harry Reid threw you under bus on the gun thing. Exactly, yeah. and Harry Reid uh, voted against that. The, what is interesting is uh, most likely in January, um, Jamie Raskin is going to be a member of the House of Representatives. Jamie Raskin, who brought a lawsuit uh, to get the district voting rights, he has a, a he is deeply steeped in these issues. He he knows them well. The question he's is, is freshman. he going to be? He's going to be a freshman, but uh, you know he has the opportunity to be sitting in that seat for for many many years. Is this going to be something he's going to care about and make part of his? Uh, something, you know, it, it doesn't... Well, and you know, there's, there's another rising star, too, who participated in some of our statehood efforts, and that's Terry Sewell mm -hmm. from Alabama. Oh, she's, yeah. she's the state... She, she calls herself the Civil Rights Congresswoman. She represents Selma. She's going to be in that seat, you know, for she's a long, very long well, time. very well respected. She's very well respected. She's very smart. Um, she cares about these issues. So there, there, there are folks that we... So you need to... I think everyone said it. I think the chairman said it. You need to be in the right committee, so. you, The chairman said it. You have to have a plan. Everyone else has talked about. You've got to have a strategy. Some, some difference between this, uh, an a idea and a strategy. And so that you talked about, you're going to have one. No, we have a strategy. I mean, there's a reason that we had Terry Sewell to speak at Emancipation Day, 
There's a reason that we had Jamie Raskin to speak at the convention, at our constitutional convention. We, you know, we talked to uh, the uh, senator, Republican senator from Alaska, Sullivan, at, at the Georgetown Law School uh, uh, alumni luncheon, and we're going in to see him. So you're going to do more of that. You're going to ramp have, that up. Yes, we okay. have a strategy. We are we are going to meet with members one by one. We're going to uh, we are identifying the voices that have a commonality to our issue, like Terry Sewell. Terry Sewell is seeking to get the other provisions of the Voting Rights Act reauthorized. That fits right into our issue. So we have to connect to other issues. We understand we can't do this just as district residents by ourselves. This has got to be a, na uh, a national issue. And when the mayor challenged us to do this, we said the number one thing we have to do, we have to put the issue on the national stage. And that's what we're doing. That's what we did at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. That's what we're going to do at every conference we can touch in this country. Yeah. I, I mean, I, again, Tony Williams was very well respected on both sides. And he could go up and get into any office and people would listen because they wanted to, to hear. Uh, I, I think we, no, I, I won't go any further. I think the strategy can't be just this. It's, it's all these things coming together. You have to do them at once. But a major obstacle long term on this is going to be what's your Republican strategy. And you know, we haven't heard that here. It's a long conversation. Oh, sure. and, and, and Tony Williams is going to be head of the advocacy committee. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So that'll be good. Now, we, we're, okay. we're expecting Mayor Bowser. I know you may have to run, but uh, do we have any quick question? Not, not speeches, but quick question for Mr. Davis and the panel before he goes. Okay, good. Can we, do we have a microphone? Okay. Fred Cook is bailing. No, no, I, have a, I, have, I have a client who's in trouble. He, oh, he's got a. <laughs> he, has, he has billable which hours. Member, which member is is it a news it. story? <laughs> is it a news story? Well, let me decide that. I'll decide that. Thank you very much for Mr. Cook. Um, he, Mr. He, oh, where's that question? Did you want Mr. Davis to answer it? Oh, okay, the panel. Okay, Claude Bailey. I understand the um, goal in having um, a pursuing statehood and what that means. How valuable is it, short of statehood, to just say have our delegate be able to vote on the floor? Is would that be a reasonable compromise? Say, or are we just going to go for statehood? I, mean, I, I can answer that. I don't view it as a as a compromise. I think I, I'm kind of uh, you know like if you hear an energy policy, the all of the above approach. You know, I think that we have to be operating on all tracks at the same time. I mean, budget autonomy is a perfect example of that. You know, does budget autonomy give us a vote in the House and two senators? No. Um, but budget autonomy energized folks in the city. It got people talking about D.C. rights. It actually accomplished something. Um, you know, <laughs> for the first time, the district is sending forth its, its, its budget, and what it puts forward is going to be law. Now the Congress is coming after us. And we're going to have to fight that. But what, should we not have engaged in that fight because we're also going for statehood? No. And we have other ideas about voting rights and some of our other rights that we also would like to pursue on a dual track you know, with statehood. Because statehood is hard. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. And I think we need to be pursuing all of these things to keep this in the public mind and also to be attempting to vindicate every one of our rights. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Do you think it would be easier just to have our delegate have a full vote in the House, as opposed to pursuing statehood with two senators and a and a rep, and representation in the House. Well, we thought voting rights was easier, you know, to use your term. But you know, then some senator, you know, hung wiping out our gun laws, you know, on our on our bill. So none of this is easy. This is all hard, and it requires the kind of strategy, you know, that we've been talking about and hard work we've been talking about here this morning. Maybe, maybe it's possible that if you try for statehood, then the people who oppose statehood might look at some compromise and acknowledge your, your lack of voting representation and, and, and allow that House vote, but it's complicated. And keep in mind that compromise, the compromise that was uh, the Utah pursued compromise. in 2009 involved, yeah, involved giving a seat to Utah, you know, that, that, and that was orchestrated over a course of years and, uh, you know, 
that you basically have to start from scratch on that, perhaps with a new state, um, and that it, it may not work in the same way. Well, I just want to say our charge is statehood. We're not seeking a compromise. We're charging for statehood. Well, but like in the legislative process, you do the best you can to get what you want, and then you look in the mirror again and say, what can you get? I mean, if the, if the goal is to have the full rights of all Americans, right. you cannot, you know, the, there, there is no substitute. I mean, there is no substitute. And, and, you know, we're right now 700,000 people, and within the next couple of de decades, uh, tell me that you're going to have a million people that do not have a vote in the U.S. Senate. Well, it might take, I think that population is 2032, we're going to have 976,000 people here, so it might take that long to get statehood. Yeah. But you, get, you have to start, right? You have to start. We'll the mayor will be here in just a couple of minutes. We have a quick question here. Thank you for not giving speeches. Um, talk into the microphone, please. That's Either to shout or talk. The strategy for the conventions coming up, you had some very progressive platform members on the Democratic platform side. Did they make any efforts to talk about D.C. statehood, and is there a strategy for the conventions? Well, uh, in case you haven't heard, within the Democratic platform, the draft, we have the statehood in the draft for the Democratic platform. And the mayor went to the platform committee, she testified, she asked for it, and they have accommodated us. So it's in. The final vote is not until, I think, the 8th of July, but we're in the Democratic platform. Uh, as you know, we have had, we're, we're working on the Republican platform, uh, and we're not shying away. We plan to go to Cleveland. <laughs> so uh, we work in both parties. It's not a partisan issue. Oh. <laughs> Well, I might disagree with you my there. Right, I've been. I, oh, well, you, they, maybe it rights, shouldn't be a partisan civil issue. civil rights are it, not attached to my party. Well, there shouldn't be a partisan issue. I've been to many Republican and Democratic conventions, and there's always at least one demonstration by the statehood supporters. And as the chairman said, it was a one off. It happens, and then it disappears. There's no sustained uh, action for that. So, uh, is there another question? Uh, all the way in the back, who's been very polite. Can we just turn those mics on? Yeah, the concern I have is this. Uh, we currently have a constitution that was adopted by the residents of the District of Columbia in 1982. I want to know what the legal status is of that particular document. Uh, well, I, I can give the short answer. Is it, uh, well, maybe John's the lawyer, but it, it does, it's no longer in effect. It was, wow. Right. It was, never, it was never taken up by the Congress. So. No. I'm not talking about whether the Congress accepted it or not. I ask you what was the legal status of it. That means right. it was a, it was adopted, right, uh, through a convention and it was ratified by the residents of the District of Columbia. So the, so the question is right. legally, what status does it have at this right. point? Right. The technical legal status is that it was superseded by the 1987 Constitution. Yeah. Well, that's the answer. That's un it, the legal answer. It's more of an, it's not going. It's not viable anymore. And I know what you're trying to say. Uh, another quick question. We yield here, right here in the front row. Michael Brown. No, just just do a quick. Try the microphones. It's kind of a modern 21st century invention. <laughs> I, I have a question for you uh, and 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 Mike. And by the way, it, this pains me to say, but Tom Sherwood is right. It was okay, Walter Fonroy. You, you have five minutes. It was Walter Fonroy that, that made that comment first, and Ted stole it from him. But anyway, uh, I want to know what can we do. I don't know why the city stands against empowering the delegation that was led, that was voted to lead this fight. Here we got a panel, and and I'm not trying to put you guys on the spot because this is very typical. A member of our delegation is a member of the DC bar. But none of us are in, invited to speak here. We're not funded. We're not paid. We, we, we're supposed to lead this battle, and our, and our hands are constantly tied. The, the chairman said there were billboards in Charlotte. What he didn't tell you is that was my idea. I designed them, and most importantly, I paid for them. The city didn't pay a dime for those. 
So what do we do, Tom and Mike, to make our delegation credible? Well, it's not the media's job to tell you what you should do, but I can tell you that this is right. Well, Noel, you know, technically speaking, we're, we're, we have no opinions. We're equal opportunity to tell us. No, there's, the, fact is, the fact is the shadow representatives, and they use the word shadow, are not respected and they haven't been respected by the leadership and by the people who vote for them. And, and I have to say also, the people who hold those positions, try as they might, have not broken through. I used to tell people, you know, it's not my job to cover you, it's your job to do something to make me cover you. And that's a very cold uh, water in the face, but that's where it stands in the shadow campaign, whether it's the two senators or the representatives, they, they have no pull. I mean, sitting in the dining room having lunch with somebody, you may make you feel good, but it doesn't mean a damn thing. What? Well, you, you know, your advocacy, you know, people give their lives for voting rights. And I used to say somebody has to set himself or herself on the National Mall, set them on fire, and as long as it wasn't Mary and Barry. And, and, it was a, and you know, people won't fight. You know, you can argue and you can lobby and you can do that, but I don't see any fight. And I'm, I, just as a citizen, apart from my being a reporter, I'm for all the legal rights for my, me and my family that you guys are. But as a reporter, those representatives you just referenced haven't done enough to make it my issue as a, re, as a reporter. Mike, you want to give an answer? I'm sorry, we can't, these people can't hear you, so just let Mike answer the question. I, I don't have a lot to add, but I, I, I think that what will make the difference in the advocacy effort, um, it's not going to be about any one person. It's not going to be any about any one leader. You could have Jesus Christ himself. You could have the second coming and, and lead this effort. It's about a movement uh, in getting, um, you know, a large portion of the District of Columbia populace to care and to, to create an, a, 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 a significant movement. Um, and it just hasn't materialized yet. I, I think that the, the perception on the Hill is that there are, there are many district residents who care about this issue, but it's the, there is not a groundswell um, where people are um, literally knocking, banging on the, the doors of the Capitol uh, demanding their rights. And that's unfortunate, and that's uh, you know where we're at. You know, remember the courts in that lawsuit um, that said it's a political issue, and it's up to the Congress to act. And the pol and that's why I keep going back over and over. Where is the political? Where is the political action committee? Where is the co Eric Holder co-chair with some other famous person to raise the money to hit, make you have a voice? It's not a matter of them hearing you. You don't have a voice. Because you can't lobby the Republicans. Who are they? Who are their family? Who are their? Who's the chief of staff to some of the Republicans? Where does he or she live in the city? Do they live in a neighborhood that they would like to don't realize? I mean, they may not even vote here, but they could be advocates too. I just don't see the groundwork of putting on a campaign. I hear aspiration, and I hear high-profile events, but I don't see the groundwork of putting on a campaign to change. Kay Bailey Hutchinson once told me in the elevator. Oh, you don't need statehood. You have 535 people representing you. I said that was a plantation. You know, we just, and that's not the right attitude. But I don't see the fire in the belly. Um, let me just say, you know, we launched this plan in April. So you say that you don't see the fire in the belly, you don't see the political action committee. In the past 12 weeks, we have done more work to move this statehood movement forward. And it's only so much you can do in 10 weeks. You do have to run the city, and I respect that. And so, you know... But the citizens don't. We have a plan. We launched, you know, it was April 7th that I met with a professor from Georgetown University that suggested that we pursue this um, Tennessee plan, mm -hmm. and you know, I have engaged lawyers like John Bowker and Fred and Walter and Bessie Cavendish. My by engaged, she means pro bono. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I've had them in my office for hours and hours and hours, and we have crafted uh, a constitution and all the things that we would 
we've tried to put into place all the things that it requires, that the Constitution requires for a Tennessee plan. We've put those things in motion in just 10 weeks. So you can't say you don't see the energy behind this. And we have convened, we have held the Constitution a convention. We've done, we've had, you know, more, a dozen meetings of public engagement. We've had a lot of, uh, there's been enormous work. And, 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 I, and I don't, and, so and I don't, and, and I don't want to disparage. It has to be a piece of that, but we have to do these things incrementally. If we you're going to get go. the substantive work done, so that we, when we go to people to ask for, you okay. know. I, I don't and disparage I in any way the things that you have done because you have done all of those things and in, in to lay the bureaucratic foundation to move forward for the advocacy. But every since covering being a reporter since 1964, it, and as what John refer, referenced earlier, every movement, if you're going to call it a movement, has been in the streets and the suites. And you guys are all in the suites at this point. But at some point, there has to be advocacy that get, demands that you pay attention to me. And, then, and if you wait to the fall to create a political action committee, it'll be fundraising when it should be lobbying. That's all. I'm just, I, I'm just wondering where the, that urgency is. I just want to add that, you know, it almost goes deeper than that. The, the great civil rights movements, social movements of the last 50 years, aren't the civil rights movement to the um, drive for LGBT rights, are built on a very basic visceral sense of injustice and and. Americans do not have that visceral sense of injustice with the, the District of Columbia. By and large, people who are aware of it and aware of how Congress interferes with the district, it's about abortion, marijuana, uh, needles, needle exchange. These are issues that uh, do not resonate, by and large, with, with a, a broad swath of America. And uh, budget autonomy is while it, it is absolutely about the basic right of, of self-determination, um, it also is ar arcane in a way that it does not um, quite resonate in the way that uh, it should. And that's, that's to me, is the difference we did that, that separates this fight from uh, the, the, the great civil rights movements uh, in America, is that people aren't feeling and seeing uh, viscerally the injustice the fact that they can't marry the person that they well, want to marry. I think there's an even greater fundamental disconnect than that, too, that we really have to figure out how to overcome, which is that, you know, by and large, the country hates Washington right now. I mean, we're seeing that in the presidential campaign on both sides. There's a very anti-Washington feeling. And it's our job to explain to the country that that's official Washington you know, that they're talking about, that this is people, Washington, D.C. People do not make the distinction. They, they do not make the distinction at all. And I think that, you know, it's our burden, you know, uh, to explain that to people, because until until we do that, you know, people are not going to care. I mean, the reason why, I mean, 10 years ago, even five years ago, we could not have imagined the spectacular progress that, for example, LGBTQ rights have made in this country. OK, all of us have a relative, a friend you know, uh, who's, who's in that community. Maybe it, we may be in that community ourselves. I mean, it affects everybody. How does this issue, how does the District of Columbia, you know, the rights of the people who live here affect everybody? That's a, that's a disconnect, and we have to figure out in our campaign how to do that. Here, let me give you an example. I did a TV story uh, on the mall. I talked to a man, his wife, and their two children. They were on the mall as tourists from Kentucky, and I asked him what they inside of the Capitol. I said, what do you think about voting rights for the citizens of the District of Columbia? And he gave me a quizzical look, and he said, but you work for us. I said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> he thought everyone in the city worked for the federal government, including the reporters. Now, I don't know what that says about him and his civics book, but that is a absence of knowledge that is in, across the country. Go ahead, quick question. Hi, I just wanted to tell you that um, I do, a few years ago, Occupy Wall Street, there was a young man who actually went on a hunger strike uh, for DC rights. So there are people, they may not set themselves on fire, but they were willing to have a hunger strike, and it was, a, a collaborated uh, effort to convince him through his mother and his family not to continue because he would have not survived if he had pursued it. So there are people throughout the country 
who do care very much once they learn about it. But the other thing I want to tell you is um, Puerto Rico doesn't pay federal taxes. I'm aware of that, yeah. So that might be a way to um, connect uh, nationwide. There are a lot of people in this, you know, if we said we always not pay federal taxes so that we can, if we don't have statehood, uh, right down the front row here, Matt, um, I, we'd have a revolution against the city then if we didn't pay federal taxes in the federal city. We're, we're acting here the so the Tennessee plan is... Can you, can we, does Mike, can you hear him? We're, we're acting as though the Tennessee plan is new. We've been following the Tennessee plan now for, what, 34 years? Uh, and I'm not sure whether this isn't the definition of insanity of trying the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. In all the other things in recent time, there's been major corporate activity. What are we doing? The residents of the district are very good, and I've been one of them for a very long time now. But what are we doing to have a new approach of trying to get the, the corporate world in the United States to be going for it, as well as the association world? It's a good example here with our DC Affairs section. It's been tried at times. that. We may bring this up in our local choir, and we'll preach to the choir here, but we're not yet getting the American Bar Association to be out supporting it. We're not getting the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to be out supporting it. What are we doing other than with the residents who are easy pickings to get people to, to do this? As I said, for the past 10 weeks, our energy has been around developing a uh, constitution to, to put forth all of the requirements of the Tennessee plan. One thing different um, about us uh, following the Tennessee plan this time as opposed to last time is my understanding that last time when the 82 constitution was developed and submitted to the Congress. It was submitted to the Congress. Our intention is is to submit our petition to the president, to the new president, and ask the new president to submit it to the Congress. I believe that's the way the Tennessee plan was actually executed. And that draws a different um, good morning, man. Um, and, and that sets up a different political framework to have the president submit the plan to the Congress. Um, and as I said, we started 10 weeks ago, and our plan is to go to the ABA and to go to every organization. Um, I said earlier that just yesterday we had a call from the National Association of Mental Health Workers, um, and they're meeting in Colorado next week. They want to put a resolution before their group. And we want, and if you are members of any group, we would urge you to do the same thing. We will be happy to develop a resolution for, you know, the ABA, for any group that you are affiliated with. So we plan to do that. And Tom, okay. the best part about this, too, is that all of these organizations are here. Every right. major organization right. that, that And, and if they're not here, they're in Alexandria. But, and every corporation, they all have offices here. All right. Good. Well, I want to thank the panel today. Of course, Fred Cook was here and former Congressman Davis was here. Mayor Bowser has come in. Mayor Bowser, we've had a very strong um, conversation about uh, not that everyone doesn't support statehood, but what do you do to get it? Ms. Perry has given us a good example of what your administration has been doing the last, um, since April at least, uh, to push this forward for the next Congress. Come in and say whatever you have to say. And welcome, good morning, and wrap this up for us. Well, I, probably everything that I am going to say has been said, and I haven't had the um, the honor of hearing the discussion um, before before I came in. But I just want to thank everybody for their interest and for helping us build the momentum around statehood uh, for for Washington D.C. in 2016. Uh, I was asked uh, all throughout my travels and campaign uh, for mayor, what are we going to do about statehood? What are we going to do about statehood? What are we going to do about statehood? Uh, and I pledged then that we would we would be bold um, and we would follow a path um, that was 
would would be different and that would inject new energy into the discussion uh, and and get us uh, things that we haven't achieved and eventually uh, get us statehood. Uh, what we all bemoaned was a missed opportunity in uh, in 2009, following the election of Barack Obama, uh, where we had uh, the, we had the White House, we had the Senate, and we had the House of Representatives, uh, and what we we didn't have was a concerted push to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, so people have asked, why now? Uh, why the big push? Um, because I don't want to be the mayor of the District of Columbia uh, where it may happen that we're presented with that awesome opportunity again. Uh, now it's going to be up to the voters all across this nation if, if that happens. Uh, it may happen uh, in the upcoming election or it may happen two years later. Uh, but when it does happen, that will be the best opportunity, in my view, and the view of a lot of people, uh, for us to uh, advance the question of statehood. So when it does happen, uh, do we want a 30-year discussion uh, to advance? I don't think so. When it does happen, we want to have a new vote, a resounding vote of, the, of Washingtonians uh, to assert uh, and demand uh, equal treatment as Americans. And that's, that's what we're asking the voters uh, to come out and vote for. Uh, well, yeah, I can say that. They come out and vote in, in November. Uh, we also want to have a, a contemporary document to attach to our Admissions Act um, that reflects uh, what, what many and most believe is a good functioning government, a government where uh, we have money in the bank, not a lot of municipalities can say that. Uh, a government that attracts many businesses and people to live here. Uh, and, and for all uh, intents and purposes, is functioning very well. What's wrong with our government is our relationship with the Congress. And so we want to uh, update our, our Constitution so that it reflects a smooth operating government, uh, removes uh, the, the relationship to the Congress, uh, and advances to the people of the of the District of Columbia, which is very important. Uh, and during our constitutional convention, uh, we heard a lot of comments. But I think one of the most telling, um, you know, discussions was from somebody who had the most say in what would happen, and that was our future congressman from Maryland, Jamie Raskin. Uh, he actually will be able to support a bill, speak to a bill. Uh, he has, uh, he's a constitutional scholar. Uh, he's been involved uh, with litigation uh, around uh, statehood for Washington, D.C., and he offered us some advice. And I think we should listen to it. We would be fools to ignore it. Uh, and he, he praised uh, being ready being ready in January if, if we're able to, if we have a politically advantageous um, situation. He also praised being streamlined, not having extraneous, um, uh, anything extraneous attached to our Emissions Act that would give fodder uh, to people who would fight against us. He also uh, cautioned us to make sure that we were being open, transparent, and competitive. Uh, if we are uh, to win, and we won't be able to do it as Democrats alone, you've heard me say many times before, it's not a partisan issue, it's an American issue. Um, so it is important uh, to be able to appeal uh, to, to people who haven't been with us and to take away um, those arguments. And so that's what I believe the Constitutional Convention and process of 2016, which will yield a streamlined document, uh, which will get us a, a, a new a contemporary vote in, in 2016 and have a package uh, ready for us. Already, and uh, our friend Mark, Mark Plotkin likes to say we shouldn't celebrate defeat or we shouldn't call defeat success or something like that. And he's right. We shouldn't call defeat success, but we have to, we have to note progress. Uh, and we haven't had, uh, and, uh, we haven't had our statehood in the platform for the Democrats in 16 years. It's in the draft. We're going to keep fighting to make sure it's, it stays there uh, when they vote in Orlando in a couple of weeks. We have a full-throated uh, endorsement uh, from the presumptive Democratic nominee. I don't know that we can point to such an expansive a statement uh, from a, a woman who, who should be the next president. 
Uh, we even have uh, our, our major libertarian candidate uh, saying uh, that he supports statehood. And frankly, I believe that that's, you know, say what you will about the Republicans' presumptive, presumptive nominee. I think before they got to him, he was even kind of saying, well, kind of makes sense to me. Uh, and so there is a, a, a lot to be said for, for the progress um, that we have made already um, in, in that push for statehood. But there's so much more um, that needs to be done. Uh, so I am very happy to have served, and I know the chairman was here a little bit earlier, and he crafted the new Columbia Statehood Commission uh, in, in law a couple of years ago. Uh, and the commission has served uh, uh, very well in organizing and bringing these issues to the fore. And I see Senator Michael Brown is here, who serves as a member. Uh, of that commission. It's been very, very helpful. Uh, well, I also acknowledge and appreciate all of the people who for 30, 40 years have been working on this issue. Um, and sometimes when you've been toiling that long, um, you, you are fixed on a, a set way to do it. Other times you, you want it to be done differently. And I recognize that many people have opinions about how uh, to proceed. Uh, but I hope that everybody knows I approached this argument and um, this, this whole process since we announced an Emancipation Day uh, as my obligation as the mayor right now and who may have a unique opportunity to lead the city um, in, in this, this new fight with the Congress next year. I'm hoping I'm going to have that opportunity. I'm hoping everybody is going to be there uh, right there with me. Uh, we were recently with the U.S. Conference of Mayors um, over the weekend. And it followed a presentation I made on uh, Meet the Press Daily. And so just to give you um, some more feedback about kind of the nas what's happening, happening nationally, uh, I also think we're gaining steam. So these are mayors from all over the country, and at least five people came up to me and said, I saw your presentation on Meet the Press. This makes sense. Why hasn't it happened already? So we're going to continue um, trying to, to build that momentum. Uh, and we look forward to the vote in November. Thank, Thank you.